this is covering the spread. Here are your hosts, Jim Sawness and Dr. Ed Feng. What is going on, everybody? Welcome on into Covering the Spread. That's right here on the FanDuel Podcast Network and NumberFire.com, where today we are previewing week number 12 with Jeopardy! James Holtzauer. He'll be getting set for week number 12. We're talking to him about, uh, you know, the the logic he used from sports betting to win $2.5 million on Jeopardy!, talk about his NFL predictive models, talk about the markets he bets, and just kind of get his backstory from a betting perspective as well. So it should be a pretty fun show for today. My name is Jim Sonis. I am a senior writer and analyst for numberfire.com, joined here as always by Dr. Ed Feng. You can find his work over at thepowerank.com. Ed, we're joined by uh, a guy who's won $2.5 million playing a game show today. So pretty fun show. How are you doing? I'm doing pretty good. Yeah, I'm really looking forward to talking to James. Uh, I, I think it's always interesting when you apply what you know in one field to another. I think that's those those type of synergies is where you get. Uh, I, I guess that's where the magic happens. So it should be great. Yeah, it'll be a lot of fun. Uh, if you don't know James, uh, he uh, like I said, won two point five million dollars as a uh, regular Jeopardy contestant. He's at three million if you count his tournament win. He's also going to be a contestant on The Chase on ABC. It was a show that was around in the past. Is being revived with him, Ken Jennings, and some other Jeopardy people. That'll be on ABC, debuting on January seventh. You can find James on Twitter at James underscore Holtzauer, uh, and we'll t- talk with him in just a bit to get set for week number twelve. But yeah, a Crazy week 11 because we had that huge Colts-Packers game, which was really fun to watch. Uh, Like, when I think about it, I think of of the big plays. But then I think about the actual viewing experience, and, like, I think Joe Buck was prepared to jump out of the broadcast booth if the officiating crew threw one more flag. Like, he was ready to go, baby. It was fascinating with all those holding calls. I think the ones that I saw the replays on, they were legit calls. Like, you know, I I mean— the Colts have a big physical offensive line and they had a bunch of Jersey a lot of times, but it was also interesting because the clock kept stopping as well with all those penalty calls and that, you know, that ended up helping green Bay as well. Um, but just like a truly bizarre couple minutes right there in what otherwise was like a, just a fantastic football game. Obviously you don't like the way that it ended with the, with the fumble in overtime, but right. And I particularly didn't like the <laughs> right. side I was on. Um, but, uh, yeah, I think you just saw two incredible teams there. Uh, I mean, I'm just – I'm kind of really looking forward to the playoffs in the NFC. I, I yeah. think it's going to be – I mean, with when you when you think about the kind of fireworks you can get with Green Bay, Seattle, the Rams, who just got a huge win over Tampa Bay, who's another good team. Um, for the most part, I liked what I saw out of Brady last night, except, you know, maybe for the picks. Yeah. Uh, but I think the Rams are legit – uh, markets had that wrong early in the preseason, although they did they did correct faster than I did um, in terms of how I was viewing this team. But they're solid on both sides of the ball. So uh, just, you know, I mean, thinking to the end of Packers Colts, which is a great ending, great Sunday night game with with Chiefs at Raiders and then a great Monday night game, too. So it was just just a, a blessing for, for anyone who likes football. My headspace is not in a good spot heading into that Rams game because anytime Jared Goff is on an island game, I know there will be bad plays. Because for the backstory, I was a big fan of Jared Goff coming out of college, and I was very happy when he suddenly became not terrible. And then (laughs) the tides turned against him very quickly. So whenever Jared Goff is on an island game, people just shred him on Twitter. And... It's not enjoyable if you're a Jared Goff fan to watch people just taking dumps on him at all times. And he was going in to face the box, which is a very good defense, very good defensive right. line specifically, without his left tackle. And I was like, oh, no, I'm going to have a bad night. And I was dreading it preemptively. But he played pretty well. He had, you know, a bad pick. Uh, but, like, if you look at the overall numbers on Goff in that game, he played really well. So I was expecting – went Monday to be a really bad night for, for Jim, the golf truther, but it actually wound up being okay. And I'm feeling pretty good today as a result. I mean, it was such a weird game because the Rams have really done well running the ball and they absolutely couldn't in that game. And, you know, I mean, I, I talked to John Sheeran last week. He he thought the bucks were going to get a lot of pressure and golf was going to struggle in that game. That didn't. And, and, you know, they're, you know, the run defense ranks a lot better. Sorry. The run offense ranks a lot better than their pass offense, but it was really the pass offense that, that got them through the game completely. Well, 
not the way I expected that to go. And I think it's a credit to Sean McVay that he recognized that the run game wasn't going to work and right. ditched it right away. Like, he wasn't trying to establish it. He just like, okay, this isn't working. Let's just do something else. And I think that yeah. there are a lot of coaches in the NFL who would not do that. So, you know, Sean McVay probably got overhyped after his first year. But, like, there's still some smart things in there. I think we should credit yeah. him when he I does mean, smart look things. look at his overall body of work. Yeah. You know, and like they had a pretty decent team in the underlying metrics last year. It didn't really work out at seven and nine, but I think we're seeing what he's doing, you know, making the switch as a defensive coordinator. That unit has been good. Uh, we should also note that they've been relatively healthy as well. I guess not True. on the offensive True. line, but uh, on the defensive side of the ball, they have been. So, yeah, just NFC playoffs. It's going to be great. I am excited. It should be high scoring too, which I will always yeah, take exactly. as well. We're going to talk to James Holtzhauer in a little bit here again. Find him on Twitter at James underscore Holtzhauer. Uh, this is our only show for this week because we have Thanksgiving, obviously. Our schedules are jumbled up. Back with two shows next week and our regular schedule. So make sure you are subscribed to Covering the Spread wherever you get your podcast. Before we get to James, though, we got to go back to last week and talk about both the college and the NFL side. Uh, we had Megan Nunez on and Joe Ostrowski. And Megan had him, had herself a really nice week last week. Covering the past. All right, so going back to last week here on Covering the Spread, starting off on the college side of things, we had Megan Nunez on to preview week number 12 in college football. Follow Megan on Twitter at Megan Making Money and follow her because she gave us some really good options uh, for betting on Saturday uh, for college football. She won Ohio State minus 20 and a half against Indiana. That was one of the ones that did not hit. It closed at 21, did look good early, but then Justin Fields finally threw some picks and struggled, and it helped the Hoosiers cover there. She wanted Oklahoma minus 7.5 against Oklahoma State. It closed at 7, but she won this one pretty easily. Oklahoma got the win by 28. Megan had Coastal Carolina minus 3.5 against Appalachian State. Now, you probably saw the Coastal scored late in that game. That did not impact the number that she got. They were up by 4, scored an additional touchdown. So they were already covering for her number before that touchdown. So the touchdown was kind of just icing on the cake, uh, and they wound up covering pretty easily there. So that final touchdown late did not impact uh, the spread at 3.5, which Megan had. She wanted Cincinnati minus 4.5 against UCF. UCF had an early lead. Cincinnati stormed back and was up by 11 with 7.15 left, but UCF did score with 4.27 left. They wound up covering, so backdoor cover there. Uh, That was the other loss, but all the others were wins. Did you Uh, see the end of that game? No, I didn't. What happened? So the game, so the so so since he was driving at the very end of the game, they're at like the one yard line. There's like 44 seconds left when they snap it on third down, and so they're so they 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 take a knee or whatever, yeah. um, and they have to snap the ball with like two seconds left. Yeah, and I think the right play there is like to snap it to a wide receiver that just runs and dodges people for a while, right? Sure. But teams, football teams don't seem to have that play. I, th- I saw it in some other game, too. Um, but they actually botched the snap. <laughs> and and they they landed on the ball. And I thought the game was over with zero yeah. seconds left, right? So they were, what, they were up four, right? Yeah. Uh, I think, or three, or, or whatever it was. Yeah. The refs ruled that they had one second left. Oh, so no. UCF got the ball with one second left and had, you know, I mean, it didn't go anywhere. Right. But, but uh it was just interesting the clock management, right? Because Can you imagine like Cincinnati losing their their season on that? Right. Oh man, that'd be nuts. Uh, so didn't get the cover there, and but thankfully they got the win at least. But that's, uh, that's I'm nuts. just saying they could they could have gotten sh- the cover had they like ran a play. I mean, no one does right. that, right? Because you're just trying to ice the game. Right. But it was kind of like that tricky in between situation where there was just like a couple seconds left, and the right. bad snap made them give it back. Right. I've seen situations where teams will do that and intentionally take a safety because they just run backwards. Uh, right. Like they sprint out of the end zone, basically, because like that'll take enough time. Um, right. But like, yeah, I think that uh, maybe that's the thing teams should practice just in case. Yeah, you never they know. should practice. You can take your quickest guy that has hands. I can almost guarantee you Bill Belichick has practiced that. I'll just put it that way. I can I can almost guarantee you that has been in their play. Like, uh, so Denver did that this week, actually. Um they they snapped it to Drew Locke, and Drew Locke just chucked it to the moon. Yes. Yeah, and exactly. Tim Patrick caught it. But, like, that's another way to do it. Just chuck it to the moon and see what happens. And, like, that also burns the same amount of time. Yeah, exactly. So that was the game I was actually thinking about because that, yeah. was, that was a game that was ending late on, yeah. on Sunday. Yeah, just, just chuck it. 
And I'm glad they didn't score. We'll talk about that in a second. Uh, Megan had Liberty plus three and a half. It closed to four. Uh, Liberty got the cover here. They were covering and actually leading outright, I think, in the third quarter. But NC State scored with 6.53 left to take the lead. They went for two, did not get it. uh, But that didn't matter because they would have been covering regardless. So... Uh, they, uh, Liberty didn't win, but they did cover here. So Megan got the cover there. The final one was you two going head to head for Northwestern versus Wisconsin. You had Wisconsin minus eight and a half. Megan had uh, Northwestern plus eight and a half and actually did like the Northwestern money line at plus 250. That closes seven and a half and Wisconsin turned the ball over like 97 times. Northwestern could not move the football uh, offensively, but the turnovers helped Northwestern actually went out by, by 10. So Megan went four and two on the week. Uh, and the recommendations, and you actually got a plus 250 money line winner too. So make sure you follow Megan Nunez at Megan Making Money. Really good week there. And add like the turnovers by Wisconsin as as a Northwestern fan, also the refs in that game, I feel bad because like I, I'm happy for Megan that she got the win there. And like it was a good recommendation. The money line was great. But like Wisconsin kind of didn't stand a chance between the turnovers and the refs in that game. Yeah, I mean, I, I I don't think I quite expressed on the show how off I thought that line was. Um, yeah. I, I really thought Wisconsin should have been favored by more. Uh, it, it obviously didn't work out. Um, so we'll see. I mean, we'll see how Wisconsin does going into the future. They still have a ton of injuries on defense. Um, probably shouldn't make you feel any better about Northwestern's offense. <laughs> Oh um, I, expect Mertz to, I expect Mertz to bounce back. I mean, I, I think he'll be a lot better. But yeah. Northwestern in the driver's seat in the Big Ten West. Uh, so we were talking about that. And, like, I am so glad that I went to Indy two years ago for the Big Ten championship game because if this had been the only year Northwestern went and we couldn't go, I would be, <laughs> like, out of my mind insane. But thankfully we went two years ago. It was a lovely time. Indy was awesome. But, like, right. if this had been the only year that they had gone – because, like, our thought process was they're never going again. We're going to go to this game. Right. <laughs> like, because we need to make sure we go when they're actually there. If they were just this year, that would have been really, really upsetting. But, yeah, I mean, they've got Michigan State, Illinois, and Minnesota left. So they better not lose those games because that would make it a really frustrating wow. way. I mean, they have a legit chance of running the table. They should. Right. Yeah, I mean, like, against those opponents, like, maybe not, like, the baseline assumption should be 8-0, but, like, they should be favored in all those, I would think, oh, at least. I, yeah, they'll definitely be favored in all those games. So you'll have additional chances to bet against Northwestern, Ed. I think... Uh, <laughs> no, but, I mean, when, you, when you're taking teams in free fall, like, that's not... I no, feel like true. the next chance I'm going to get is probably Ohio State, and the markets are going to be... Oh, yeah. That's not going to be pretty. Yeah. That, that's I don't not going to be good. Much value there. So Northwestern was good to, to Megan here. Uh, they were not good to me because I had Matt Fitzpatrick, who is a Northwestern, uh, former Northwestern student in golf, uh, to win 27-1. to 1. He didn't make it a sweat because he missed the cut. Uh, so that was annoying. Uh, Matt, he, he, go, he went by Matthew originally. He now goes by Matt. And I'm pretty sure we need to get him to get, go back to Matthew because the play as Matthew or Matt has not been as good. So uh, Northwestern, good to us in college football, bad to us on the links. On the NFL side, we had Joe Ostrowski. You can find him on Twitter at Joe0670. He had a lean on the Titans plus six. It closed right there. Uh, Joe got the cover in the outright ran. I saw, I saw some fives actually at one point, but I think it closed back at six there. But regardless, Joe gets the win because the Titans win in overtime for that one. He also had the Chiefs minus eight against the Raiders. That was right when all the Raiders defense was put on the COVID list. They eventually did come off, or most of them did, and uh, they gave the Chiefs a great fight here and almost won. Uh, the Raiders uh, covered despite that, so... Uh, one to one for Joe there. Last night, Joe had the Rams plus four against the Bucks. The Rams defense, like you said, played really well. Uh, they got the win out right there. I think that was my worst prior coming into the year is that the Rams defense would be bad. I thought that with all the contributors that they lost, I thought that they'd be a really bad unit. But apparently having Jalen Ramsey and Aaron Donald can make up for a lot of ills elsewhere. So uh, as again, as a golf guy, I'm happy that I was wrong but I was very, very wrong there. Joe thought the Steelers might be looking ahead to this week uh, for their matchup with the Ra- or with the, the Jaguars, so he wanted the Jags plus 10. Close at 10.5. The Steelers, 
put that one away pretty easily. Uh, so they, unfortunately, the Jags did not cover there. Finally, Joe was on the Lions minus one and a half against the Panthers. That one bounced all over the place with uncertainty around Teddy Bridgewater. Originally, Teddy was active, and then three minutes later, he was inactive. I was doing victory laps because, like, there was a certain reporter who was like, oh, Teddy won't be active on Thursday. I was like, oh, he's wrong again. Like, this this person reporting this was wrong again. Working against information was, was good for us. And then Teddy was not active three minutes later, so I looked very stupid. Uh, but regardless, uh, the Panthers did win that one 20 to nothing. So bad showing by Detroit there. Your bet last week was the Packers plus three and a half, and it closed, or plus one and a half, I should say. And it closed right at one and a half, and the Packers were in control early. They were up 28 to 14 at halftime, and then they forced overtime. So for a four quarter spread, you were right. Uh, and then they won the, won the toss, then Marquez Valdez scantling fumbles. Like a really good game. That's a tough way to lose, is on a yep. fumble at the 30 yard line. Yep. Tough way to lose. That's how it goes. I'm I mean, a tough. Yeah, go ahead. I mean, I was kind of 0-2 on what I talked about on the show, but my numbers had, like, a ridiculous week in both college and pro. So it comes and goes, right? Yeah, exactly. I mean, it's like the one game. I mean, I still feel pretty strongly about Pack in that game. Yeah. Uh, but it just didn't work out. Yeah. Um, you know, but uh, that's how it goes. Uh, you had the bad luck. I made up for it with good luck on my end. I should not have won my bet. Uh, I had the Broncos under 20 and a half points. Got very lucky. They were at 20 points in the third quarter. And I was like, oh, geez, like, come on, man. The one time the Broncos offense shows up the first three quarters and it's going to bite me. They were driving for another touchdown late in this game. Melvin Gordon got the ball to the one yard line. It was initially rolled a touchdown, which would have put them over 20 and a half. But not only was that overturned, but it was ruled a fumble. The Dolphins recovered and the Broncos did not score the rest of the game. So, with the bad luck I've had in other bets this year, losing by a half point, I'm pretty okay going ahead and taking the win with this one. Even though I didn't deserve it, I'm going to take it. Also, uh, so the way that, that that Drew Locke play worked out at the end, I felt good. I was like, okay, they're going to kneel. I've got the win here. I'm good. And I wasn't watching that game. I think I was watching the end of the Packers-Colts game. And I saw on Slack... Uh, JJ Zacharyson and Brandon Gadula were talking about, oh, Drew Locke's pad and his stats. It's like, oh my gosh, did he throw a touchdown in the <laughs> final play? And I was like, did I lose this bet on the final play of the game because Drew Locke decided to throw a touchdown? But no, yeah. it was just that he he threw it way downfield. It was caught, not a touchdown. I was like, oh no, I let myself get comfortable and lost a bet I deserved to lose. But wound up winning. So, again, given the way the last two weeks have gone, I'm going to take that, uh, even if I did not deserve to win that bet. Let's take a look forward now to week number 12 in just one second. But first, betting on the NFL is great. Betting on the NFL with FanDuel Sportsbook is even better. Right now, FanDuel Sportsbook is giving you a chance to bet on the NFL season with reduced risk with their exclusive same-game parlay insurance. Simply place a three-leg or more parlay. If you don't win your bet, FanDuel will refund your bet to $25 and site credit. What do you have to lose? Head to FanDuel Sportsbook to place your same-game parlay today. Must be 21-plus and present in New Jersey, Pennsylvania, Illinois, West Virginia, Indiana, Colorado, Tennessee, or Iowa. Refund issues a non-withdrawable site credit that expires in uh, seven days. Max refund $25. Terms apply. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER. In West Virginia, visit 1-800-GAMBLER.net. In Indiana, call 1-800-9-WITH-IT. In Colorado, call 1-800-522-4700. In Iowa, call 1-800-BETS-OFF. And in Tennessee, call the Tennessee Red Line. Now let's get to James Holtzauer. Again, you can find him on Twitter at James underscore Holtzauer. He is uh, Jeopardy James. Won $2.5 million on Jeopardy. He is also a professional sports better. So we're going to talk to him about his NFL predictive models, what the markets have been like in 2020, and also get his thoughts on some of the biggest games in week number 12. Covering the present. Let's bring James Holtzauer into covering the spread to preview week number 12 in the NFL and talk about just general sports betting. James, I appreciate the time. How are you doing today? Hi, doing all right. It's good to have you along here and obviously a lot of different topics to, to cover here for sure and getting your backstory and talking about, uh, you know, how you wound up on Jeopardy and all those things. But I'm sure a lot of people listening don't really know your backstory. They probably know about, you know, Jeopardy James, et cetera, et cetera, but they may not know your backstory. But when you were winning all that money on Jeopardy, you credited your background in sports betting for part of your success. So 
what's kind of the overlap there? Because like, to me, at least as someone who's more of like a, a casual Jeopardy viewer, I don't, it's hard for me to see the overlap between the two. So what was kind of the key there for you between the two? So I'll say um, probably the most important thing is just attitude. You know, I think when you're a pro gambler, you get the idea, someone called it like the idea of money as game pieces. You know, you don't think of this as uh, money in front of you that's to buy a car. It's like money that you can use to win a pot if you're playing poker or to uh, make a winning bet if you're a sports better. You know, it's, it's your ammunition to, uh, to a greater end. Um, so one big thing I did is, you know, a lot of, Players who uh, study the Jeopardy board, they know the daily doubles are more likely to occur in certain categories and certain dollar amounts, and they they aggressively hunt for those. But once they get there, they don't use them as the weapon that they're meant to be. You know, to them, it's like, okay, you know, I got this daily double grand, I'll bet a, I'll bet a few thousand on it, and you know, hope hope I get lucky. But you know, if you are a serious student of Jeopardy, I mean, the average contestant gets the Je- daily double right like 70% of the time, so that's already an enormous edge. If I could win 70% of my sports bets, I you know just I'd be richer than Bezos right now. Uh, so you're, you're being offered even money on it. What's at its base of 70% proposition. If you're a good contestant, that can go up to like 90% very easily. Um, and the daily doubles, actually, if you study the game board, they're, they're easier than the average Jeopardy clue for you expect for that amount. So you're just getting this great value proposition and, you know, you can use it to, if you're behind, you're instantly back in the game. If you just move all in, or if you're ahead, you know, you can put the game completely out of reach just in one in one swing, you know, and you have to be willing to put your money out there. But again, like, you know, when you have the gambling mindset, you think, okay, this this amount in front of me, it's not money, it's points. You know, you don't you have to win the tournament to to cash out your winnings. If you finish second place, someone actually finished second place with a score of fifty four thousand dollars and they reduced it to the two thousand dollars second place money because it's not real money, right? So you you get the idea, hey, uh, I I can use this stack in front of me as a means to an end you know yeah. i think the big the big difference is just the attitude shift um beyond that you know there are some things like you know when you're a serious sports better you're looking for every edge that's out there right you you don't just consider the the main nfl card you look at oh if i if i slice this up you know is the first half line a better proposition than the game is the money line better than the point spread you know you think okay can i get a better deal if i study history more than geography or more than opera or things like that you know you you have a limited amount of space in your brain for facts and, you know, you try to figure out what's the important stuff that comes up on the show. What, what do I really need to know here and what, what stuff can I let go because it won't be on there. Well, we're going to talk so to you about your, NF, your NFL modeling here, but I also want to hear about your Jeopardy research because there was a lot of data you had in there. Like how long did you spend researching the data behind Jeopardy before you were actually contested on the show? Uh, well, okay. I would say off and on, this has been a project of mine for, I don't know, 10 years or something like that, but I don't, I don't know. I took it a lot more seriously. They, they, when they, you have a, an online test and when you pass the online test, they have like a random draw for people who get to go to, well, it used to be an in-person audition. They're doing them on zoom now. And, um, at the, I think about 20% of the people who go to the in-person audition, get the call. And when you get the call, you have about three weeks before you actually tape. So, you know, three weeks is not enough to get to full speed on this stuff. So I was like, you know, I had a, a general preparation mindset in mind, but I would say like, you know, that three weeks involved a lot of cramming and a lot of, okay, you know, what, what is it exactly I want to do? And I, uh, you know, tinkered with some strategies and then I, I kind of ran a simulation that said, what if I, I program a player who just goes all in on it, literally every daily double and that, that contestant did surprisingly well. And I thought, okay, you know, <laughs> all I have to do is actually have the gumption to risk the, uh, the money when I'm out there. And, yeah, I can I can do things no one's ever seen before, and you know, people, I heard a lot of talk about oh, this will just change the game forever. But it turns out, you know, I don't. I think there's been like one guy who used to be a pro poker player who's been on the show since then, and he did fine for himself. But for the most part, you know, people don't gamble as aggressively as they need to to play optimally. James, that's fascinating. Um, yeah, it's it's surprising that people haven't kind of caught on to that as much. So you've done a really good job telling us about kind of the strategy aspect um but we are also interested in data uh and we're more interested in, in the predictive models that you built for for understanding football we would never ask you to divulge all your secrets but can you kind of give like a you know a thirty thousand foot uh view of, of what you're doing with your modeling well, my nfl game model is not the most sophisticated thing ever you know it's based on fairly simple available stuff like yards per play differential success rate things like that you know that 
it's I, I I like a more macro view for that. And then you know let's let's face it, the NFL game market is tough. You know you the way I see it, there's a few things you can do to beat it. You can bet like right when the lines come out, uh, when they're still soft, and you know the limits aren't great, but you can get a solid edge there. Uh, you can do like halftime or in-game betting where they're just tossing a number out there and you're getting to it before it softens in the market. Or you can look for, you know, stuff in the prop markets, first half, first quarters, things that are off uh, the general marketplace. But, you know, it's it, if you really want to make a profit, the NFL is not the best place to start, <laughs> I would say. I mean, if you if you insist on betting like $100,000 a game, you're going to find it hard to find any other markets to bet other than like European soccer. But, you know, I think it is not the first place a pro would go to find a big edge. So where do you tend – I know you've built models for other sports. Do you tend to find more success in like, like baseball, college basketball, or uh, wh- what's the sweet spot for you? Um, the sweet spot for me ever since I started like 15 years ago has always been futures. And those markets, I mean, they have gotten a lot sharper, but you still find bets in there with like a 30 40% edge that you just don't find in NFL single games unless you know, you're the first person to receive news that a quarterback got injured in practice or something like that. Um, I will say it's a little easier in sports like baseball. I don't know about college basketball futures, a little tough modeling for me. I think, uh, baseball and football futures have always been my kind of bread and butter. One thing you've been talking about, uh, you mentioned in, in a story with David Purdom in, in last year, you said that your focus now is more on in-game betting. You kind of alluded to that too, where you can find softer markets with in-game betting. What are you looking for when you're trying to hunt for, for good lines and value in live odds? Yeah, so there's a couple of things. Um, you know, one thing I find with sports books that offer betting on every play rather than just during commercial breaks, there are times where a, a team will like get a 30 yard pass or something like that. And they just, you know, I don't know if they're worried about people trying to hammer the team that just got this pass thinking they got a, the old odds or something like that. But they, they usually move the line too aggressively in that spot. And if I was like on the fence about betting on the defense in this spot uh, before that play, I'll usually fire on them at the new odds because I think they're, they move, they corrected too much um, in that spot. There's also like times where you see they're not accurately modeling. I think how often the game will land on an exact number. Uh, you see this, is, this is especially true. I think in the second half where there's only like a few possible, let's say a team is winning by seven uh, in the fourth quarter, you know, they, the game might land on 10, it might land on three or something like that, but you're, you're kind of reducing the, the number of possible outcomes and they sometimes don't give, adequate weight to uh to an exact number so i often will find myself like betting at multiple books trying to middle a uh a result something like that very nice and i think like in general you know uh i don't know if you guys ever talked about the concept of price discovery on this show it's a uh, great concept um there's there's a book the logic of sports betting it's a really good read for like you know intermediate yeah. level sports bettors and they they talk about you know if you bet an NFL game on Sunday morning, you know, the market has had a week to look at this number and basically people who, who had an opinion have weighed in on it, you know, in game, someone's just putting a number out there, you know, they might've had only seconds to review it and think about it. And they they make mistakes. You know, you, you don't need the most sophisticated in the model in the world to beat someone who's only had a few seconds to think about this sort of stuff. So James, would you say, especially when you're doing in game betting, you're relying much more on strategy and much less on a model? Uh, yes. Yes. And no. I mean, there's, there's, you, you definitely should have some kind of basic model of, uh, you know, at the very least, take into a, uh, account the pregame spread and what's happened in the game so far um, and, you know, what team has the ball, where they're driving in the game state. But, yes, there's a lot of intuition in there where I, I just, you know, in between plays, I don't have time to run a sophisticated simulation. But, you know, I might have an idea in my head, like, okay, I was on the fence about betting this team. Now they just got stuffed on first and ten. So that's, you know, a, a percent or two edge. Now I, I'm ready to fire on it. That kind of thing. Now you have your own, you, your futures models, and you have your in-game, your your full game models. Do you have your own win probability and live models for yourself as well, or is it more so using it intuitively based on what your model said before the game, and then betting based on that? Yeah, I would say it tends more towards the the second thing you said. It, yeah. You know, you it, it's the thing that comes with experience, and I don't know, like sometimes you kind of have to think, okay, you know, if if five percent of NFL games land exactly on seven and now we're we're at halftime, you know, and the the 
amount of potential outcomes for the game has been cut significantly. You know, that is the value of that seven much higher. And just, just intuition would say, yes, it's hard to exactly put a value on how much, but you know, if you are familiar with like betting NFL quarters and uh, halves and things like that, you know, that yeah, the, the game just gradually individual numbers take on more and more importance as the game goes on. I think that's the biggest edge in in game is to, to look around and find opportunities like that. Oh, that's awesome. James, we'd love to get your opinions on some games. Uh, Ravens are at the Steelers on Thursday night. Uh, Steelers are a four and a half point favorite with a total of 45. Steelers are uh, 10 and 0, but maybe a little bit overrated based on that record. Uh, what are you thinking about that game? <laughs> I mean, I don't think that the Steelers are your typical 10 and 0 team. Like I just, I just read a uh, thing on ESPN this morning comparing them to other 10 and 0 teams, and they rank near the bottom. But you know, I, I also think people understand that, and this, this is reflected in the line. Um, I made this game about. Steelers by three and a half, but that was before any of this COVID news. And I'm not really sure uh, how, what to, you know, th- there could be more layers to this than we realize. And, you know, what, what happens a lot of these times is, you know, if, you, if you're down to your second string guy, that's not a big deal. But if you have to, you know, your depth chart takes such a hit that you're playing a guy who's not an NFL player. And that really uh, is, is a big thing uh, that people need to consider. I don't know. I, the, to me, the Ravens offense hasn't looked right without Ronnie Stanley in there. I, I know some people I respect think Lamar is hiding an injury and I'm not a, you know, kinesiologist. I can't look at this and say one thing or the other, but it, it's, I don't know. They are not looking like the team we thought they were a month ago for sure. Yeah. When you have situations like this, where there's still some uncertainty with the Ravens, because like, there were reportedly four more players who tested positive today. That has not been reported yet as of our recording. Is that a situation where it's a stay away for you? Or are you trying to get on the Steelers before the line may shift more? Or how are you handling situations like that in a very unique circumstance, obviously, for 2020? Yeah, it's my general policy to try to stay away unless, you know, I think they're so new. You know, if, if I if I received some kind of tip that LeVar tested positive, I'd probably just fire on the Steelers on spec before they took the, took the line down. But I don't, I don't know. It, it makes me less willing to bet rather than more when I see that kind of murky news out there. Yeah, especially this one. It sounds like there are multiple players out there still. So a lot of uncertainty there. So let's move to Sunday and talk about the Titans and the Colts. Colts here are three and a half point favorites. The total is 50 and a half. And this is a spot where we just saw these two teams play two weeks ago. The Colts won that game pretty handedly. So I want to talk about this more broadly, James. We have a lot of divisional rematches this week. What information do you look at from those first games in repeat matchups, if if any at all, when you're trying to diagnose what will happen in the rematch? Okay, so uh, full disclosure, I did not watch that game. I was in the studio recording a, uh, a TV show all day. I mean, I, I looked at the stat sheet afterwards, and I could not believe the uh, the dominance. I was on the Colts. Um, you know, I've been on the Colts a lot this year, but I think that the market is catching up to the idea that, hey, this is actually a good football team. I know a ton of people were surprised they were favored over the Packers last week. I'm not really sure they deserve to win that game, but you know, you, you see the the sharp money is really coming in on them. Um, I mean, I think that this line is about right. I would make it, you know, a heavy three myself, but I I, I don't know that I take into account the uh, the last game these two teams played as a a specific thing to look for. You know, I'm obviously the fact that. Indianapolis played so much better in that game is weighted into my model, you know, as they're, they're a better team, but like, you know, if they, let's say that Indianapolis had played, I don't know, some other decent team that week and had the same results and Tennessee had this, laid the same egg against another team. I don't think that I would weigh in the fact that it was against each other any more heavily. Excellent. So let's move on to the last game. Uh, Chiefs at Bucks uh, should be a fascinating game. Chiefs are a three and a half point favorite with a total of 55 and a half. Uh, Bucks have kind of been up and down this year. I'm personally still don't know what to think of this team. Uh, Chiefs are, you know, probably probably your Super Bowl favorite. Uh, what what is your take on this game and these two teams? Yeah, um, first thing I'm going to latch on to is the Super Bowl favorite thing. You know, it's interesting. Uh, one of my biggest edges in the past has been betting the team that has the number two seed uh, because I think that the one seed is getting a lot of attention, but people don't realize the mathematical edge of the, the two seed over the three. Um, you know, if you have like six equal teams in the playoffs, so this is in the old format, then the two seed would advance to the Super Bowl about 29% of the time. And the three seed was only like 11, you know, I think the one seed was 35, something like that. So, you know, the, the gap between the two and the three is really huge. Um, and I think that this was undervalued by the market. Now, of course, this year, 
well, allegedly you're going to have one team with a bye, but, you know, honestly, I'm not even sure I trust them to <laughs> not have the, the one seed face the eight if they expand the playoffs and some games get canceled. So, you know, it, it's, it's really complicating the futures market out there. Um, I mean, I, I, I think everyone agrees that the Chiefs are the best team in the NFL, but, you know, having to win three playoff games uh, could be a, right. a significant hindrance to them that the Steelers might not face if they get... I think they, the tiebreaker situation is not clear either. So, you know, if they finish with the same record, the Chiefs might sneak into the one seed. It's, it's an interesting spot. Um, anyway, I, I'm kind of surprised to see this game on that side of three. Uh, I would, you know, say it's, you know, between two and a half and a three for me. But I think that, you know, people might be reacting a lot to what they saw yesterday. Uh, I don't know. Tampa was not as sharp as they, they could have been. I don't think they they played a terrible game. You know, if you look at the stat sheet, it came out all right. But there were a couple of bad interceptions that made the final result look worse than it could have been. Uh, yeah, I mean, I don't know. Three and a half seems like a lot, but you never know. <laughs> this is the magic of the yeah. NFL. Yeah, it doesn't do it? sound like you're ready to fire too hard on uh, Bucks plus three and a half. <laughs> not, uh, not itching to get to the window, let's say. Right. Yeah. So, James, yeah. I want to talk to you about the futures market because you said that, like, that's where your 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 bread is buttered, effectively, uh, you know, a lot of the time where you feel most comfortable. But there has been a lot of uncertainty this year, not just uncertainty, but, like, there have been moving parts with regards to the rules, both in baseball earlier on and also now with football. Has that impacted your willingness to enter the futures market knowing that we don't know everything as of right now? Yeah, for sure. You know, I laid off completely off baseball futures this year. Um, I mean, I think e- even if I had known for a fact that the rules were going to be the way they were going in, you know, something about a 16-team playoff where anyone can just get knocked out uh, in a best of three in the first round, that was uh, – really crazy to model. I mean, I, I would not have been on the Dodgers, so I guess, you know, I, I, I saved myself some money there. Um, regards to the NFL, I think, like, tiebreakers. Tiebreakers are a huge thing that sometimes the book isn't paying attention to. You know, you have, uh, like, in the, in the NFC South, uh, I guess, you know, the Drew Brees injury kind of really complicates modeling because who knows when he's going to be back. But, you know, the fact that uh, the Saints have already swept that season series, I guess they have a uh, – a pretty substantial lead in the standings now after this week also. But, you know, you, you look for a spot where a team has that head-to-head tiebreaker or something. If you can get a good division price on them, that's that's something that they don't always take into account. You know, I think some places still they they have their their simulator, and if, if the teams end up tied, that counts as half a victory for each of them, but that's not how the NFL does things. Um, those things can uh, impact the seeding too, you know. So Green Bay has a head-to-head victory over New Orleans, but New Orleans now is ahead of them in the standings. Uh, so who, who gets that one seed is really still up in the air because of these, uh, these head to head tiebreakers. And, you know, then it goes into like conference record and common games. You really, you really just have to do the dirty work to, uh, to figure out who's going to come out ahead in those things. So James, it's a lot hard to do the dirty work when they haven't told you what the dirty work entails <laughs> as far as the rules. Right. And, and you know, yeah, right. you know, it, building in a simulator that has like, okay, here's, here's one power rating for the saints for the next three weeks. And here's another one for the playoffs because their quarterback is back. It's it's a lot of work, but it's worth it. No, that's, that's super interesting. Um, Do you have all the tiebreakers coded in when, when you're doing these? I'm pretty sure I do, but you know, usually if I, if I can see it's going to come down to something uh, dicey, I, I go in and look at it. I remember there was a, it was four or five years ago um, that, Texans and the Colts were racing for the to the finish. And the Colts, I think, like an 11 game parlay on the last uh, Sunday of the season to to win the tiebreaker because they, you know, it was they went down to like strength of victory and they needed not only their games but the other games, the other teams they had played needed to win stuff like that. So, so sometimes it gets really tough, but the, the, the stuff yeah. like common games and conference opponents and division records, yeah, that that stuff is all in there. No, that's super cool. I, I remember going back. I, I have some college football conference win probabilities. And I remember I got to some point, you know, the code was like six levels deep about tiebreakers. And I still wasn't done. But at some point, like, <laughs> I was mostly interested at, you know, from the beginning of the season. I was like, I don't really care about like 0.2 of a percent. Right. But that's but that uh, I appreciate the work that you put into that because it's, it's, like there's nothing hard about it. It's just you got to go in and like do every single case and how they come. And in college, like it's different, right, for different conferences. So sure, and that that kind of stuff really doesn't matter that much at the beginning of the season. It's more like when you're in the season that one team has established an edge, or um, you know if you're betting on a team to win their division and they're kind of trailing in the race, but 
if you think about it, like in order to tie with the team ahead of them, they would have to sweep the season series. That's that's kind of a built-in edge for the trailing team in that spot because they're they're going to have that tiebreaker in the event that they get there. Yeah, fascinating. Yeah. That's awesome. Uh, James, we're not going to ask you to give out any picks, obviously, but were there any other games that stood out to you for, for Week 12 as being interesting based on where you were setting the numbers relative to where the markets are? Uh, let me go check up the odds page right now. Um, I don't know. I'm interested in this Carolina-Minnesota number. I assume yeah. that uh, they're, they're saying Bridgewater is not going to be playing. No, but Carolina is like... saying that he is. The number at okay. four and a half is like kind of that implies to me that it's not because it feels like they're not that much of there's not that much of a difference between Minnesota and Carolina straight up. Right. I mean, I, I think uh, the market is finally realizing now that home field advantage this year is not what it was. I feel like at the start of the year they were they were doing too much. I guess you needed a little bit of data to confirm, but yeah, I, I think I'm I'm down to like one point for for home field. Yeah, me too. Uh, I suppose PJ Walker would not be. Uh, Catching that many points. Okay, let's see. Uh, I don't know that anything really seems that off to me. You know, it's as I said, the the NFL market is is pretty short. right. But, yeah. You know, you you can find easier stuff to to win money at if that is your only goal. I know it's the it's the most fun thing to watch, and that's it's sure. unfortunate you can't marry uh, <laughs> profit and watchability that easily. Yeah, I bet some uh, ho- hockey is my second favorite spectator sport. I uh, that one, you know, I, th- I think my model is even less sophisticated than it is for football. But they there's some like math plays. I often try to middle uh, total of six or something like that on a hockey game when I can see that there's market um, fluctuations. Nice. That's nice. awesome. Well, James, maybe we'll have to get you on to talk some hockey at some point or some baseball yeah, or anything. Yeah. That that was great. It was great to talk to you and great to hear about uh, the overlap between two subjects that seem very, very different. That is James Holtzauer. Make sure you follow him on Twitter at James underscore Holtzauer and check out his new show coming up in January on ABC. James, we appreciate the time. Uh, good luck to you with the show and good luck with your bets this week as well. Thank you. This show is called The Chase. Uh, it'll be on January 7th. Awesome. awesome. Thank you so much. We Check appreciate the time. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, Ed. Covering the future. Big thank you once again to James Holtower for swinging by and breaking down week number 12. And Ed, it's always fun to talk to smart people. And like, James, we know the intelligence from Jeopardy, but you can tell that like, he's very passionate about the sports betting stuff too. Obviously, if it's his profession, like he, he knows what he's doing. That It was a fun conversation. Yeah, absolutely. I, I thought it was it, w- it was interesting about you know the whole daily double thing about just yeah. expected value, right? Like that that's a, that's an easy thing to think about, and yet no one, not really anyone since has kind of done it. Which is the only exception is uh, they had a Jeopardy greatest of all time tournament, and Ken Jennings used it against him. He used that same strategy uh, in the Jeopardy goats uh, tournament. So like. It was awesome that he did it when he was there, but then it got used against him when he was playing against right. Ken Jennings well, uh, later on. So that's that's the downside is everyone can see your strategy and then use it against right. you in later tournaments. Yeah, well, that's 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 the way it goes, I guess. But I, I think just the you know the idea of how you're using sports betting and other aspects of life is, is fascinating, and and that's the way it should be. And we see this overlap everywhere. You know, it's not just sports betting and Jeopardy, which is kind of a weird one, but like. Poker and betting, poker and daily fantasy, daily fantasy and betting. Find areas in which you're good, regardless of what it may be, and find ways you can apply that to other arenas. That's going to be a good thing for you and uh, hopefully get you on Jeopardy with James as well. Let's move now into covering the future and get set for uh, week number 12 in the NFL, but also week 13 in college football. Ed, we have no college football show this week, but did want to get some college football talk in the show. What are your numbers saying about week 13 in college football? Yeah, I mean, I'm really liking Iowa State plus one and a half at, at, at Texas this week. I mean, when you look back at this Iowa State team, they, you know, they don't look particularly good at seven and six last year, but they were two and four in one score games. And when you kind of look at like my kind of like this year number based on points and yards per play and success rate, uh, they were 20th last year. So this is a really good team. They bring back Brock Purdy. Uh, and they've gotten they've gotten better on both sides of the ball. So they're 18th on offense and 30th on defense when you look at my adjusted success rate. Um, you know, motivation is not an issue at all in this game because they're six and one in Big 12 play, and uh, they're in the lead in the Big 12. 
So, I mean, winning a conference title would be incredible for these guys. You know, um, you know, Texas at four and two, but my numbers don't really like Texas as much. Um, they had wins over West Virginia, Oklahoma State, and Baylor, uh, but Texas had the worst success rate in each of those games. So, um, you know, overall, they've really kind of slipped from last year. The, the offense is 39th in my adjusted success rate. The defense is 60th. Uh, both those are lower than last year. Kind of don't expect that on offense, especially with a veteran quarterback like Sam Ellinger. Um, so, you know, my numbers would have made Texas about a, almost a seven, touchdown favorite in the preseason. They, they definitely like Texas in the preseason and not, not as much Iowa State. But at this point in the season, I have Iowa State by 6.4 points. A lot of that is uh, the success rate numbers uh, that I talked about. Like, my system's really docking Texas for uh, not performing those last games, despite the fact that they outscored their opponents. So, I mean, I think Iowa State should win um, outright as a road underdog. How often do you find discrepancies in the market like that this late in the season? Because we talked about James, like the NFL market being super yeah. efficient. How often do you get discrepancies as big in, in the college side this deep in a year? Yeah, so that's a great question. Um, I was shocked how big this one is. And so when I went, when I looked at it a little bit more, so this is like my current model, which kind of, it, it works a little, yeah, now I'm giving away a lot of secrets, but whatever. <laughs> so this, it works like an ELO system, right? Like it looks at what you were supposed to do and it looks at what the markets thought and other metrics like success rate and it makes an adjustment based on what happened. And what I found is this system tends to move fast. Yeah. So it'll move fast to dock Texas because they, they weren't performing against these past three teams. It'll move fast to bump Iowa State up. Um, I ran my model that I normally run um, and it had uh, Iowa State by, I think, a point and a half. I think Bill Connolly had Iowa State by two. Yeah. Talked to Mike Craig about this game. He probably had Iowa State by two. Yeah. So I think with this model is on the far side of what the prediction is. Not All these quantitative systems like Iowa State outright in this game. Um, yeah. I think you can make the strong case based on what we've seen from both of these teams this year. I mean, you know, Texas is probably the more talented team. But I think you got to go with a better football team uh, here. So, so anyways, that's that's the short story. Like the, yeah. this system that's at six points for this game is moving really fast on both these teams. Okay. And you know, like I, I mean, I've tested like this new model against what I had last year. The new model yeah. is, is doing better, which is why I continue to put it out. Yeah. Um, when I look at like the root mean squared error. Uh, so, but yeah, it, it is a big gap. I yeah. mean, I I think I wouldn't be surprised if Iowa State ended up being favored by a kick. Right. I mean, there are a lot of downsides of pandemic. At least we have one positive is that we found a really good model for Ed uh, that could work out this well. So uh, we'll see about Iowa State. And I'm always pro Brock Purdy propaganda on the show. We haven't got to talk a lot about it because of the weird college schedule. But anything pro Brock Purdy? Okay by me here on Covering the Spread. My uh, Covering the Future for today is going to the NFL side, and I want Miami minus 6.5 against the Jets. I think this is a good bounce-back spot here for the Dolphins because last week the offense was really bad against the Broncos to the point where, like, Tua got benched. But this Jets team is a very different team than the Broncos, specifically because they don't get any pressure. The Broncos generate pressure on 26% of opposing dropbacks. That ranks third among all defenses based on the numbers over a pro football reference. And that's tough against a Dolphins offensive line that has improved from last year. They're better than they were, but they're not what I would call good yet. And that's going to struggle. That's going to show up against a team like Denver. The Jets are not like Denver. They rank, uh, they are generating pressure just 16% of the time. That's second worst. Best in one of the Titans, which is kind of surprised to the Titans all the way down there. But uh, the Jets, bad regardless. And that should allow Tua to be more comfortable in the pocket. And he has shown that he can do well in those situations because Tua against the Chargers and against the Cardinals, he was solid if he was given time in the pocket. And his efficiency, if you look at the three games, including the game against the Rams where he didn't really do anything, it was actually above, above average, slightly above average, and it was in line with what Ryan Fitzpatrick was doing earlier in the year with the same offense. The Jets defense will be starting a pair of rookies at cornerback, uh, so the Dolphins should be able to move the ball here. 
This Jets offense, yeah, they're better than they were now that they have their top three receivers healthier. But this is a really tough spot for them because the Dolphins rank sixth based on number fires metrics and schedule adjusted defense. And the games where the Jets put up points came against the Chargers, who are 13th, and the Patriots, who are 19th. So I think the Dolphins are being undervalued in a spot where they should be able to handle this game pretty well. I would uh, bet this game probably gets to a touchdown at some point because right now 94% of the money at FanDuel Sportsbook is on the Dolphins minus six and a half. So I think you should be looking to get this one while you can because I would not be shocked if it's at seven in the very near future. And I know that your numbers are not as high on the Dolphins defense, but what do you see in this game with the Dolphins favored by six and a half? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, it, it's it, it's it. I don't really take my numbers too seriously on the Jets. It's it's one of these things where it, it's kind of hard to catch up with with what they're doing. And I actually had a nice conversation with John Sheeran about it, where in 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 games with a team with free fall, it's it's good to just trust the markets, right? I mean, yeah. there's there's a lot of subjective opinions that that wisdom of crowds can kind of answer better than a model that that relies on your preseason prior. Um, and and anytime you have a model that relies on the preseason prior, like it, it's going to struggle to get get teams like this. So um, I don't know. I don't I don't really know what to think. I, I think the Jets are really bad. I don't, I'm not quite sure what to think of Miami uh, yet. Uh, it's probably not a good sign that Tua got benched. That pick that Fitzpatrick threw to ice the game was pretty bad. <laughs> Shocker! Mean, Shocker that Ryan Fitzpatrick could throw a bad pick. We've never seen that yeah. before. Yeah. Yeah. These things happen, but but yeah, I don't know. It's a game that I'm certainly staying away from. Yeah, so we'll see how that one plays out, but I think it's uh, hopefully a better spot because I think part of the reason Tua got yanked was because they don't want him to get railed by that defensive line. I think uh, this could be just me hypothesizing, reading too much between the lines, but I think that may have been a motivating factor, so I will get in the Dolphins here at minus 6.5. As mentioned, this is our only show for this week here on Covering the Spread because of the Thanksgiving schedule. We are back next week, though, with two shows for college football and the NFL, so make sure you are subscribed to Covering the Spread wherever you get your podcasts, and if you like what you hear, be sure to leave us a rating and review as well. Ed, what is going on for you this week over at the Power Rank given the weird disjointed schedule? Yeah, no, the, the free email newsletter with a sample of my best predictions usually say for paying members of the site is still happening. Uh, go check that out at thepowerrank.com. Uh, if you need all my analytics uh, to help uh, to provide you with a subjective baseline for, sorry, objective baseline for, uh, for your betting process, uh, you can go check out thepowerrank.net. Uh, that'll take you to a place on my site where you can learn more about a membership. All right, powerrank.net for that. Make sure you follow Ed on Twitter as well. At the Power Rank, I'm at Jim Sonnes, J-I-M-S-A-N-N-E-S. We have our Thanksgiving DFS show already posted on the Number Fire Daily Fantasy Podcast feed in our Week 12 NFL DFS main slate preview goes up tomorrow. So make sure you check that out by searching for the Number Fire Daily Fantasy Podcast feed and also follow the FanDuel Podcast Network at FanDuel Podcast. Big thank you to James Holtzauer for swinging by and breaking down Week Number 12. Make sure you follow James on Twitter at James underscore Holtower, and uh, also check out his new show, The Chase, on ABC, which debuts on January 7th with him and Ken Jennings and others. Should be a whole lot of fun. Thank you to Calvin Theobald, our video producer. Very busy guy today was Cal. So thank you, Cal, for sticking around and getting us through today. With a lot of stuff going on. Appreciate it as always. And thank you to everyone for tuning in. Good luck with your bets this week. Have a fantastic and safe Thanksgiving. We'll talk to you again next week. This has been Covering the Spread right here on the FanDuel Podcast Network. (laughs) 